Okay, gang. So, here we are. So this is uh, Cowell 126. This is the trajectory of justice. Uh, we teach this course each uh, spring quarter, uh, and we address the uh, most current issues of justice that are facing our country and the world each spring. Uh, we have an abundance of riches uh, this spring, uh, having to do with justice, of course. Uh, and, but but today, today we have uh, students from the Rachel Carson College, and the, specifically the engineering, sustainable engineering uh, students, that are going to be with us. Uh, and we're convened in the Adlai Stevenson uh, College. Interestingly, with Rachel Carson's being uh, Rachel Carson being one of the major uh, players uh, in the environmental movement in the United States, uh, often referred to as the mother of the environmental movement. She was largely responsible for generating the creation of the Environmental Protection uh, Agency here in the United States. <clears throat> in Adlai Stevenson, uh, after whom this college is named, is many of you don't, he probably sounds like Ulysses S. Grant or somebody to, to, to you guys in your generation, but Adlai Stevenson was the, the fellow in the Democratic Party that that if he had been elected in 1952, when he ran against Dwight D. Eisenhower, we would have uh, spared the country Richard Nixon uh, and, the, uh, and the entire ordeal that we went through, which would have included probably eliminating the political assassination teams that were set up by Richard Nixon uh, when he as vice president uh, brought in Alan Dulles to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and set up the political assassination program, et cetera. So the, it's appropriate that we're here in the Adlai Stevenson College uh, talking with people from the Rachel Carson uh, College. And in the Cowell, Cowell College, which is uh, the, the Cowell Natural Forest around here, are named after, uh, after Henry Cowell. So that the environmental focus of the, of the course this year uh, is, is due to the fact that one of the major elements of the trajectory of justice this spring is having to address the issue of global climate change uh, because of the half dozen major uh, news stories that we're addressing that relate to justice uh, this spring. Uh, probably the principal one is global climate change. That there has been a huge pouring forth uh, of additional information from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, there's been a major study done uh, by uh, over a dozen of the major agencies of the United States government that have now joined in the chorus of telling people that it's dramatically worse than anybody thought. Uh, that it is accelerating at a rate that was uh, anticip unanticipated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change when they made their initial findings. Uh, they're discovering that the, uh, the ice caps are melting uh, much faster than had been anticipated. They're now uh, projecting that there is a high degree of possibility that the entire uh, Ar Antarctic shelf uh, may, uh, may slide into the sea, uh, generating over 200 feet uh, increase in the global mean sea levels. Uh, which would mean that uh, everything is going to be underwater here in this town uh, and all of Florida and the probably all 400 of the major private nuclear power stations uh, that are within a mile of the seacoasts throughout the world. Uh, so this, this is a major concern uh, of the course uh, that we have here uh, and is also, as I said, one of the major headline uh, issues of our, of our day. The, the second one, of course, and the reason, the reason that this is in the news is because the uh, leaders of the planet, the governmental leaders, are so transparently slow walking, uh, doing anything effective about this. Uh, and the reason for that is transparently the fact that the major oil corporations, coal and, and natural gas corporations, are basically paying for their campaigns. Uh, and are engaged in a conscious program of deception. Uh, we now know, and it's established now, that they've known since the 1970s that uh, their burning of petroleum, the sale of their products, uh, and the promotion of their products is in fact generating massive climate change. 
uh, and that it's going to be having and is now presently having disastrous consequences. The headlines of today are that there's been over 100 tornadoes in the last 48 hours uh, in the in the states of uh, of uh, Illinois and uh, and Oklahoma and Missouri, uh, and they expect it to be going on all weekend long at this same rate. Uh, there are torrential downpours of, of uh, rain in those areas. The uh, rivers are overflowing. Uh, the Missouri River has overflown. It's uh, flooding 85% uh, of all of the counties in, uh, in the state of Nebraska. Uh, the, the Pine Ridge Reservation, the, our staff from the Romero Institute is leaving today to drive back up to Pine Ridge to try to uh, negotiate getting the Federal Emergency Management Agency to provide disaster relief for the reservation. The, uh, the, the Trump administration's Federal Emergency Management Agency has maintained that they don't do reservations. Uh, they do states, uh, so they don't know how to cope with a reservation. Uh, and they're saying they're only going to give the uh, money to the state of South Dakota uh, which has its own uh, discretion as to whether to give any of it to the tribe. So that the, the issue of global climate change and its direct immediate consequences are right at the very top of the headlines uh, today, uh, competing, of course, with the impeachment of Donald Trump, uh, which is constantly in, in the news every single uh, day uh, and leading the news usually until the tornadoes reach over 100. Uh, in, in a given 24-hour period, uh, and then that uh, ascends to the leader uh, of, the, of the headlines. But this, this impeachment, as we know, uh, is, is generating a third major story, which has to do with this war going on inside the Democratic Party between the new, more moderate uh, Democratic Party that has arisen at the end of the Cold War uh, led originally by Richard Gebhardt and, uh, and Bill Clinton and the people that are part of the uh, Democratic Leadership Conference uh, that has actually been trying to lead the Democratic Party uh, to the right, uh, suggesting that they were getting too far uh, out and that now that the Cold War had ended, there was no real need for the Democratic Party to be providing any kind of alternative to socialism. Uh, by having these kind of uh, mediocre uh, programs uh, that, uh, that are only moderately sufficient to be addressing some of the economic injustices in the country. So that we have not only global climate change as the lead story, the impeachment as the second leading story, but this confrontation that's going on inside the Democratic Party between the new more moderate elements of the Democratic Party and the liberal and progressive elements inside the Democratic Party. Uh, and this is manifesting in the debate over the impeachment, as you know, that the progressives, members of the Progressive Caucus that are now 98 members of the House of Representatives out of 435, are leaning forward uh, demanding the immediate impeachment of Trump on the grounds that what he has done is so completely unacceptable that they cannot possibly leave him in office without his being impeached at least uh, to stop a precedent being established that if any president comes in and chooses to do what he's doing that uh, everybody will just advocate waiting until the next election to see if you can get him unelected. So that, that, those top three major stories that are going on now are now being challenged by the trade war with China uh, also, the potential th threat to invade Iran, uh, the, the suggesting that they're potentially going to be sending over 120,000 United States military personnel into the Middle East to confront Iran. Uh, and, of course, we have the uh, growing news of the, uh, of the Keystone XL pipeline uh, that, is, that uh, the Trump administration is attempting to build all the way from Canada, the tar sands in Canada, all the way down through the central United States to the Gulf Coast, where it will be refined and sold internationally to everybody except China, uh, defying all of the uh, efforts on the part of 193 countries at the Paris agreements in December of 2015 to all agree to roll back uh, the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, so th these are the, the headlines that, that we've been addressing 
uh, in this course. As it turns out, it's not coincidental that they coincide with the, uh, the headlines, the major headline issues, because we want our course to be pertinent uh, to you as a generation. Now, we have in the first part of it, from April 1st all the way through to April 29th, we were addressing the issue of global climate change. Uh, we've done a, a, a deep dive on global climate change and the students have become uh, expert uh, at the issue of, of global climate change. Uh, John Conway, the PhD uh, graduate in environmental science from uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara, has presented a great deal of information and details to our class about that so as to get ourselves squared away at the very beginning to understand thoroughly the science behind this issue of global climate change. So that the fact that the oil corporations hire the same public relations firms that were hired by the tobacco industry to try to disprove the fact that, that the smoking cigarettes was causing cancer, that despite the fact that there is a tiny number of these so-called uh, scientists who say that global climate change is not real, uh, and there's no nexus between the burning of fossil fuels and the, the uh, onset of global climate change uh, is more than just a controversial issue. Uh, this is pretty much a, a completely established issue now, and we spent the first month of the course dealing with that. Uh, the second portion of the of course, from uh, basically May 2nd all the way through to the 21st of May, we've directed our attention to the issue of the impeachment. Uh, our, our students now are uh, walking experts on the issue of the impeachment. They can recite to you almost verbatim the entirety of volume one and volume two. Uh, they, they sleep with it under their pillow. Uh, we've had lots of discussions about it. Uh, they're, they're also knowledgeable about the debate going on inside the Democratic Party about whether to actually impeach him. And we've had long discussions about some of the subtleties that are involved which has to do with the fact that uh, both the Republican and Democratic Party leadership are conning everybody uh, into believing that there's no really strong evidence about collusion and that therefore we should all shift our attention to just the obstruction of justice and there are these 10 key things that have been identified by Mueller as obstructive acts uh, and uh, they're, the, the House of Representatives is digging in just on those. And to make the transition into getting you up to date on where we are, uh, in the course, we pointed out that the, the, uh, this myopic focus just on the obstruction of justice uh, is going to be one of the two major challenges uh, in any potential success in getting Donald Trump not only impeached by the House of Representatives, but convicted by the Senate. Uh, the first challenge, of course, is that the Senate would, all dominated by Republicans now, uh, would, not, would not convict Donald Trump if he shot someone down on Fifth Avenue. Uh, and it turns out Trump knows that. Uh, and the second major problem, however, is, is that in order to focus on just the obstruction elements in volume two, uh, is going to meet the, the constant argument that, well, how can you have obstruction of justice if the, ju if the investigation itself wasn't justified? If, as long as there's no collusion, uh, there couldn't have been any obstruction because it wasn't any crime to really try to obstruct. And so therefore, any rational argument as to why Trump was obstructing or doing what he was doing was as a result of frustration, the fact that he thought it was a hoax, uh, a whole bunch of different defenses other than the corrupt motive of attempting to obstruct justice. Uh, and so that uh, we had suggested in, in transitioning out of part two of the course that there are other issues to look at uh, with regard to the collusion. Uh, and even though, even though uh, Mueller went to the length of pointing out that there's no such thing as collusion, you have to be looking for a conspiracy. And conspiracy has certain elements in it, and he, he's unable to find a particular agreement uh, that would explain why it is that Trump was acting the way he has been acting toward Putin. Uh, uh, and so that it might just be a, a policy issue that, uh, that Trump wants to establish better relations with Russia and for that reason it wouldn't be a corrupt motive. Uh, and so we, we discovered that uh, it isn't likely that the, there's a handful of different motives that have been tossed up uh, to be evaluated. One of them are the, is the famous videos uh, that you've heard talked about, uh, about Trump 
you know, uh, hiring prostitutes in, in Moscow and all that sordid stuff. Uh, and also that they allegedly have uh, uh, videos of him over in St. Petersburg with prostitutes. And that therefore, so, Russia is blackmailing the president. The, the problem with that is, is that's too much like uh, the failed attempt to convict uh, Bill Clinton. You know, so, so he, prior to being president, has, has engaged in sexual indiscretions, no matter how lurid they might be, uh, doesn't really support uh, a, an impeachment. Uh, the second, the second uh, uh, objectives that they have in trying to suggest that there might be uh, a, an, un, an improper relationship uh, placing the president uh, in a vulnerable position to Russia is the argument that he was money laundering uh, money for the oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs, that they were depositing their ill-gotten gains in the Deutsche Bank uh, in Cyprus, and that that bank was then turning around and giving loans to Trump uh, to build his Trump Towers when no one else in the world uh, would give him any loans, and that therefore Trump has become beholden uh, to them. Uh, the, the, the problem with that is, is that to the extent to which the Deutsche Bank has successfully laundered those funds, uh, the deposits on the part of the Russian oligarchs, they're lending money to Trump uh, may well have successfully laundered those monies. Uh, and that the banks, the banks don't want to be put in a situation of, uh, of saying that th there has to be an, a close examination of the source of deposits that come into their banks in order to support their lending the money out. So they want the banks to be designated as a complete wash, uh, primarily because so many of the major banks have so much of their money from drug money uh, coming in from around the world, uh, and that they all know that, and they don't want that looked at. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the likelihood is very low that their, the Republican Democratic Party leadership, with the support of the financial industry, is going to look at that. But what we, have, what we have discovered, and I'm just closing this kind of introduction for you to get you up to where we are. What we discovered, however, is there's a very peculiar thing that really isn't being looked at much. Uh, and that is, it was a portion of the Steele dossier uh, in which Steele asserted that, uh, that this fellow Carter Page, who was the first person that was subjected to a FISA warrant, the, uh, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, that had the surveillance put on him, that Trump is trying to characterize as spying on my campaign, uh, and that the Republicans in the Senate have now asked uh, Attorney General Barr to investigate the lack of bona fides of any legitimate motive to place uh, Carter Page uh, or, uh, under, uh, under surveillance. What we've discovered is that uh, the dossier, the Steele dossier, asserts that Carter Page uh, brokered a major uh, deal uh, that was having to do with the sale of 20% of the private, the, the previously government-owned Russian oil company, uh, Rosneft, uh, and that there's direct evidence that uh, this guy, Carter Page, went to Russia and met directly with high-level officials of Rosneft and help negotiate a potential sale of 20% of the Russian oil company to Trump and his associates, secretly. Uh, and there's a, a party to this sale uh, that, that's called the Internet uh, Inter, Intertrust Group that is completely concealed, the members of it. Uh, and it has an address down in the Grand Caymans uh, the Grand Cayman Islands, which are notorious for, uh, for hiding illegal monies, uh, and that the address of this uh, intertrust group is the exact same address in a small building with uh, a fellow named Stephen Schwartzman, who is a major economic advisor to Donald Trump. And it turns out that the law firm that actually negotiated the transaction of the sale of this 20% of this private, this uh, major national company was in fact the law firm of Rudolph Giuliani. Uh, and so there's all kinds of uh, evidence floating around here that, uh, that, and it says in the dossier that Carter Page 
met with Igor uh, uh, Sechin, who is the CEO of the Russian National Oil Company, met with him personally, and they struck a deal that 20% that of that company would be sold to Trump and his associates in exchange for Trump, if he's elected president, uh, lifting, the, lifting the restrictions against Russia that had been imposed by the Obama administration for Russia uh, entering into the eastern portions of the Crimea in the, in the Ukraine. Uh, and the sanctions imposed upon Russia for their purported meddling in the 2016 election. And so the, the, the Steele dossier specifically says, in a little, little uh, attended to a sentence, that Carter Page actually met with the CEO of, Neft, uh, of Rosneft and negotiated a deal that if Trump were to be elected president, that he would lift the sanctions. Uh, therefore, enabling ne uh, Rosneft to develop the Arctic Shelf uh, of northern Russia, uh, which has 87 billion barrels of, of petroleum under it, uh, and some 30% of all the natural gas on the planet. Uh, but the, the challenge is, is that in order for that, uh, that uh, oil and natural gas to be made available, uh, the, the restrictions on the export of oil from Russia have to be lifted. Uh, and uh, moreover, global climate change would have to continue in order to melt off the major ice that's above those ice shelves so to make it economically feasible. And, uh, and, uh, so that, and thirdly, there would have to be a pipeline there would have to be a pipeline built from far in the north of, of Russia all the way down past the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, picking up the oil from under the Black Sea and the natural gas from under the Caspian Sea and brought all the way down to the Gulf of Arabia uh, from 45 degrees north latitude down to about 25 degrees uh, north latitude, uh, virtually identical to the length and area of the pipelines from Canada to our Gulf of Mexico. And that, that that pipeline would have had to have gone through Afghanistan. And it turns out that the tribal people of Afghanistan refused to allow the pipeline to be built through their territory. Just like the traditional Lakota people are refusing to allow the pipeline to be built from Canada down through to the Gulf of Mexico. And it turns out that this replicates the conduct of the aboriginal people in Africa, in Nigeria, in opposing the, pipe, the, the pipelines and the drilling of oil in Nigeria by Royal Dutch Shell. And it also uh, is virtually identical to the tribal people in Ecuador uh, resisting the drilling of oil and the contamination of all of their water there. And so, so what we've done is we've pointed out in part two of this course that there is in fact an area that bears important investigation uh, the, because what they discovered is that Donald Trump in preparing to deliver his first major foreign policy address on April 27th of 2016 before the November elections of 2016 he was scheduled to deliver his first major foreign policy speech at the National Press Club, but at the last minute, minute actually on the 25th, the, the locale was changed of that, the venue, over to the Mayflower Hotel. And the Mayflower Hotel was, was leased by the Center for National, the National Interests, this major organization, a principal board member of which is the partner of the man who owns the building down in the Grand Caymans, where the company was that was involved in purchasing this 20% share of the Russian oil company. And it turns out that immediately prior to that speech on April 27th, there was a, an exclusive invitation only VIP cocktail uh, reception in which 24 people were there, virtually every one of whom was directly involved in the sale and purchase of that Russian oil company, okay? 
So, and, and McFarland, Robert McFarland, who is one of the people that was among those 24, published an article in the National Interest, the magazine of the Center for National Interest that sponsored that speech. He published that in June. This was April 27th, so it's just basically one month later in the beginning of June. He published an article in which he said that, the, that Russia was going to become the major principal partner of the United States in protecting the energy security for Western civilization. And so that, that, that starts to tell you. Now, if Russia has been suddenly changed from being the East in the East-West conflict to being part of Western civilization, then who is Eastern civilization? It is China. That's the deal here that the reason that George H.W. Bush invaded the Middle Eastern oil fields under the ruse that Saddam Hussein originally was going to be invading Kuwait and then invading Saudi Arabia, and so he got Saudi Arabia to invite him to come in to, uh, to basically drive Saddam Hussein back up into uh, Iraq. And the reason that W. Bush then later lied about it and said that that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and he sent in the rest of the troops to go in and occupy the Middle Eastern oil fields was to deprive China of access to the oil fields and to the oil because China does not have major oil reserves. And that that's what's really going on here. And I would recommend for anyone who wants to look deeper into this is that you take a look at this book which is called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. This is by Samuel P. Huntington. Samuel P. Huntington was, at the time of writing this book in 1993, right at the end of the Cold War, he was the, the president of the American Political Science Association, of all the major political scientists in the United States. He was also the Olin Professor of International Relations at Harvard University, and was, in fact, the editor of Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, so this is no slouch that's making this argument. And he's the one that's arguing on behalf of the United States and Western civilization getting away from all of this increasing multiculturalism, as they refer to it. That if we're going to successfully confront China in the rising of the new Asian empire, the, the, the Caucasian race has to get past all of this integration that is going on with other with other races, uh, in that this, in this entire process uh, has got to stop of multiculturalism, that we've got to regress back to being a white Christian community, uh, ideally Catholic, and ideally reaching out from the Roman Catholic Church to the Russian Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and bringing them back together again because the essential driving engine of a civilization is their religion. And that therefore he's arguing that they have to return to a white Christian society. Now, so which give you some idea of the echoes of Steve Bannon. That the Steve Bannon, as you know, who is Donald Trump's principal strategic political thinker, uh, has advocated the exact same thing. He, in a, in a speech that we have gotten a copy of, because I was given a copy of it by the head of the uh, the Vatican uh, archives, who had a copy of it, was a, was a, a, a Skyped-in presentation that Steve Bannon made to a bunch of hardcore right-wing reactionary Catholic uh, leaders uh, in a thing called the, uh, the Institute for Human Dignity, made up of people from Opus Dei and the Knights of Malta, in which he explicitly and at some length advocated that they had to be aware of the fact that there was a bloody third world war that was, had to be launched by them against the indigenous people of the world who were anti-capitalist, anti-Christian, religiously driven, jihadist terrorists who were going to be attacking and stopping the production uh, of the Western industrial powers. Uh, and so that, uh, and he advocated when he, during that brief period between January 21st and April 5th of 2017, 
when he was a member of the National Security Council, actually explicitly recommended that the Dakota people, the Lakota people up in the Dakotas who were opposing the Dakota Access Pipeline and the, uh, and the uh, XL Pipeline, that they be considered to be anti-capitalist, anti-Christian, religiously driven, domestic jihadist terrorists. Okay, so there's, there you've got it right there. There's the connect that's going on here. And for that reason, we are now moving into the third uh, phase of our course here, discussing the role of the indigenous people and, and being able to participate in stopping global climate change. Because what's going on here in this alliance between Putin and Trump uh, in their financial backers is the attempt to triple the amount of petroleum in natural gas that is going to be sold, developed and sold and burnt into the atmosphere uh, in directly in the face of the Paris agreements on the part of 193 nations other than Russia and the US now to stop global climate change. And so the, the uh, uh, attributing to these people, these elements of a nefarious, uh, corrupt motive to be knowingly and willfully destroying the climactic system of the planet is completely true, as it turns out. Uh, and that therefore they have to be stopped. Uh, and so the question is, is what percentage of your generation and mine uh, who are not indigenous people are going to work with the indigenous people to stop the drilling of oil and petroleum uh, in their areas uh, and the building of these pipelines to be shipping the oil and natural gas from about 45 degrees north latitude all the way down through the aboriginal territories of these indigenous people down to the warm water ports uh, to have it, it sold uh, in the world to be burnt. And so that's what we're, we're entering into now is the third portion of our course in examining uh, the, the potential role of the indigenous uh, people. And so what I, what I want to do is I want to, uh, there, there are uh, a number of, uh, of centers where these conflicts are going on and that we're going to be talking about these uh, over the period of now between now and basically June 6th. Uh, and these, these are, of course, the Middle East, the, the, what the history is of this conflict going on between the indigenous people, the tribal people of the Middle East, and these, this element that wants to exploit their oil. Uh, also, North America, the major confrontations going on in North America on the part of the Lakota people in the Dakotas and some of the other indigenous groups all the way out to the West Coast uh, in, the, in the people from Canada as well against the Trans-Canada Pipeline. Uh, so that's, that's not, not only uh, the Middle East, but North America. Also, uh, Central and South America. We're going to be focusing on Ecuador and the indigenous people rising up against the pipelines and the, and the drilling uh, in their aboriginal lands down there uh, in the effort on the part of the Pachamama movement to try to ally white people uh, with the indigenous people to try to stop that, that type of exploitation. Uh, and, of course, we're going to be focusing on Africa as well, which has to do primarily with Nigeria uh, and the Royal Dutch Shell and what they're doing, uh, mounting major ap activities against the indigenous people. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's th so. So what? What? What's going on? When? When I was the uh, I was the director of the uh, strategic in initiative for the new paradigm at the State of the World Forum at the end of uh, the Cold War that we convened up in uh, San Francisco to invite all the former presidents, vice presidents, and secretaries of state, etc to come in to try to discuss how we might take advantage collectively of the end of the Cold War to be able to establish some sort of a new relationship among the people of the world that could help save us from global climate change, among other things. And at that point, I, I met 
uh, Dr. Zhen Zhou Jing, who is the head of the Chinese Academy of Social Science, Science and Technology Division. Uh, little known to most Americans, there's a, a huge uh, center in Beijing of 300 professors from all around uh, China that are there to service the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and they have a whole science and technology division that Dr. Zhen Zhou Jing heads up. And what they were, have been doing is they are, have been looking for an alternative source of energy, uh, an alternative to petroleum and natural gas and, and coal. And uh, we had a long set of meetings with them. They have set aside an entire 50-second economic development zone, uh, which is an actual, they brought me out to see it. It's actually a gigantic city. <laughs> it's, got, it's got office buildings and suburbs with homes, and it's got factories and highways and uh, in the whole nine yards. And there's not a single soul in it. Uh, and they've got it built uh, to prepare for developing an alternative source of energy, generating electricity. And what they're going to be doing is they're going to be building uh, like 30 million uh, electric vehicles uh, to make available to the people in the world, sort of like the Volkswagen bug uh, back when Germany did that. And that what they're going to try to do is to make these electric vehicles uh, available at an extraordinarily uh, uh, government subsidized low price in order to defeat the effort on the part of the Western powers, including potentially Russia, to monopolize the control of petroleum. And so that China knows what's going on here. Uh, you know, if we can figure this out in our class, China can figure it out with 300 professors sitting there working on these things every day. Uh, and so that what we're, what we're going to be focusing on now is the, the potential counteroffensive that needs to be undertaken against this effort on the part of not just the Trump administration and not just the Republican Party, but you're going to see also the new, more moderate Democratic Party, you know, led by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden as their hand-picked candidate. Uh, you know, they're all going to continue to just slow walk uh, this whole issue about global climate change. And they're going to be trying to have as slow as possible a diminution of the use of petroleum uh, because the people who fund their campaigns and both of the major political party structures uh, are oil corporations uh, and, and, uh, and insurance companies and a whole series of others. But the, the major petroleum corporations in the coal industry, and, and McConnell, of course, McConnell's from Kentucky, uh, and he, he wears, he wears t-shirts around championing coal, still, uh, in the, in, in still insisting that global climate change is a hoax on the part of who? China. That's their whole, that's their whole uh, narrative, is that the global climate change is the biggest hoax in history uh, created by China to attempt to undermine our industrial base uh, in North America and the West. And so that the, uh, the people, at least the people who are not being conned by this are the indigenous people. The indigenous people know what the relationship is between our human conduct and the impacts on, on nature. Uh, they know what their relationship is to the, uh, the natural order of, of things. And so that they immediately uh, red flag any effort on the part of these major oil corporations to come into their territory and poison their territory uh, with their drilling and with their, their uh, excretion of all of the, uh, the chemicals and things that are involved in, the, in, in coal mining and the, uh, and the digging of the oil and the natural gas and the fracking uh, that's going on to get the natural gas out of there. And so that, so that what we want to do is we want to focus now on uh, the study of, of these areas. Now, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to focus first on the issue of the Middle Eastern oil fields. Uh, and we've touched upon this, that what, what we do, I, I do in this course is I repeat a number of different times coming at it from different directions, some of the same information so that it will stick with us to know what we're doing here. And so I'm going to review some of that here today. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to the issue of the Dakota Access Pipeline Challenge. I personally legally represented uh, Chase Iron Eyes, 
who was the uh, 2016 Democratic Party nominee for the Congress, the single seat in Congress uh, in North Dakota. And he was designated by the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation that was brought in by the Energy Transfer Partners. Uh, to, uh, he was designated as the ringleader of the basic insurrection against the state of North Dakota and the Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, I was personally defending him and am intimately familiar with all of the issues that are involved with the Dakota Access Pipeline. And we are now working intimately with, uh, with the people at the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, Julian Bearrunner, who is the elected tribal chairman, a 32-year-old young fellow who's the new tribal chairman of the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, along with uh, Harold Frazier, who is the elected uh, chairperson of the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. These are two of the major reservations that are going to be adverse, most adversely ad impacted by the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. <clears throat> so we're going, to, we're going to be talking about this primarily because, uh, the, because I'm engaged in uh, one, at the, one at the same time, not only instructing you about what it is that's going on, but attempting to recruit you and doing something about it. Uh, so it, more than you had planned. Uh, so that our, our whole effort here is to, is to guide you into directions to use your education to participate in stopping this massive global climate change that's underway. And some of it, however, is going to require that in addition to applying your explicitly learned skills at the college and graduate school level, there's going to be an additional uh, responsibility that you have. It spins off the old story of the doctor who's sitting in her office and a person comes into her office with a broken leg and so she sets the broken leg and, and puts a little cast on and the person leaves and an hour later another person comes into her office with a broken leg and uh, she you know, sets their leg and puts it in a cast, etc. And a third, a third person comes in an hour later and she can't figure out what's going on, so she goes outside and she opens her office door, and there's a gigantic hole in the sidewalk that people are falling into uh, and breaking their leg. And so she decides that even though she's a doctor with all of her years of medical expertise and all that kind of stuff, she better spend some time filling in the hole. Okay? And so the, that's what we're talking about now. Even though you're studying to be, you know, engineers, sustainable engineers, absolutely extraordinarily important work, and others are, are planning to be lawyers and doctors and, uh, and other things that, that your generation is going to have to spend a portion of your time allying with the indigenous people of the world to participate in stopping this global climate change. Because Donald Trump, the second thing that he did upon coming into office, he came into office on the 21st of January of 2017, and the first thing he did, as you know, he issued the, the executive order banning all Muslim people from coming into the United States. Uh, and then the second thing that he did on January 24th was issue a, an executive order ordering the United States, uh, Corps of Army, United States Army Corps of Engineers to reverse its decision that they had to stop the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline because it was in violation of the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act. Okay, and so he just came in and said, you know, screw the Environmental Protection Act. We have a domestic energy crisis here in the United States. We need to, as the president, override the application of all of these rules, not only the Environmental Protection Rules, but also the Administrative Procedures Act rules that have to do with, with, uh, with due process that goes on if you're going to be applying for a permit to build a major pipeline like that, you know, transferring 91,000 gallons an hour of petroleum uh, right through some of the most uh, important environmental areas of the country, okay? Uh, and so he just came in and ordered that they go forward and do that. And he said not only it applied to the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline, but also to the Keystone XL Pipeline. And he ordered them all to ignore the Environmental Protection Act rules and go forward and do this. And he reversed the decision made by the Obama administration to completely cancel the XL pipeline, the Keystone pipeline. It was to transfer the tar sands from Canada all the way down through the United States to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so he ordered those things to be reversed. And within a matter of days, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers said, pursuant to the order of the president, 
we have reversed our position on this without any explanation for it, without any kind of rational justification for it, completely ignoring the Environmental Protection Agency's rulings before that had been undertaken pursuant to due process, and ignoring the Department of Justice ruling that this was in clear violation of the Environmental Protection Act. So that was the second thing that he did. And, and in fact, he then ordered the opening of all Indian reservations in the entire North America to drilling for oil and the mining of coal and fracking for natural gas and also opened all the national parks for the, for the massive oil drilling and coal mining in natural grass fracking. Uh, and he also then opened up all the coastlines uh, including the Gulf of Mexico that had that massive horrible s spill and all the coastlines, the, the east and western coastlines, op ordered by executive order, ordered them all to be opened for the drilling of oil. Okay, and he, and all under the ruse of there being a domestic energy shortage, and as soon as he got that done, after a matter of a couple more months, he announced that we had now overcome the domestic energy shortage and our real objective was to become the number one dominant energy producer on the planet. Uh, and when he says we, he means the private corporations that are the ones doing this and the ones whose shareholders are sharing all of the profits in this as all the damages are being laid off onto the public. Uh, and so, so that's, that's what's uh, going on here. And so what, what I, what I want to do first... Uh, is I, I want to point out that this, this process of invading the Middle Eastern oil fields, uh, which to this day, not one-tenth of one percent of the people in the United States are actually grokking that that's what happened. You know, they, they get caught in all of, these, all of this deception of, oh, well, didn't Saddam Hussein have weapons of mass destruction? Oh, I guess that was proven not to be true. Oops, I guess we got that wrong. But as long as we're there, uh, we might as well keep them, you know? Uh, and they are completely blanking the fact that that was the second invasion of the Middle Eastern oil fields. It wasn't the first. The first invasion took place back in 1991 under George H.W. Bush. Uh, and what I want to do now is I want to repeat probably for the third time for, for all my other students who are now learning this by heart. But what, what, what happened there, the, and I want, I want you to be able to go home and I want you to be able to tell your family about this. I want you to be able to tell your friends about this. I want you to be able to tell all your other classmates in the, the School of Engineering about this and over at Rachel Carson College. I want you to tell them about this. Because the fact is, nobody seems to know it. But what happened is that in uh, June of 1991, now remember, the, the Soviet Union officially dissolved on December 31st of 1991 when, uh, when Gorbachev signed the release, releasing all the different republics of the Union of uh, Soviet Socialist Republics from having to stay part of the uh, USSR. Okay, and, uh, and so it was six months earlier in June of 1991 that George H.W. Bush, the president at that time, now remember, he was elected in 1988, November of 1988, after serving two terms as vice president under Ronald Reagan. It went on from 1980 to 1988. He gets elected in November of 1988, so he's president in 1991 in his first and thank goodness only, term. Uh, what he finds out in June of 1991, he starts getting information from his Central Intelligence Agency that there's indications that, that Gorbachev is actually planning to dissolve the Soviet Union and to withdraw from the then 75-year Cold War. And what, uh, what uh, George H.W. Bush uh, says, well, wait a second. Uh, if he does that, then we're going to lose our major adversary that we've had for 75 years. We've been using the fact that Russia was purportedly going to be trying to take over the whole world. We've been using that as an excuse for having a $400 million, $500 million, you know, uh, seven, up to $700 billion annual military budget. 
in order to protect all the rest of the world from being taken over by the Soviet Union. Uh, and if the Soviet Union withdraws from this uh, Cold War, we're going to be left high and dry with no excuse for continuing to have a $700 billion a year military budget. Uh, and so what he did is he uh, sent a handwritten communication to Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq, uh, whom, as it turns out, he knew personally, because when George H.W. Bush was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 1975 to 1977 under, under Gerald Ford, right after Nixon resigned in August of 1974, Gerald Ford appointed George H.W. Bush to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And it was in that capacity that he came to know personally Saddam Hussein, because Saddam Hussein had been financed to come into power in Iraq by the Central Intelligence Agency. And so he knew him personally, so he sends a handwritten note to Saddam Hussein in June of 1991, hand-delivered to Saddam Hussein by April Gillespie, who was the United States ambassador to Iraq. And she delivers the note to him, and it says in the note, it says, uh, I am aware of the fact that you're having difficulty with Kuwait on your southern border, and that you believe that they're slant drilling under your boundary and stealing Iraqi oil from under your territory. And I want to make it clear that I would like to have that dispute resolved peacefully. But if you find that that isn't possible, uh, I want you to know that if you find it necessary to resort to the use of military force to stop them from doing this, I would personally not find that to be adverse to the long-term interests of the United States. Okay? So it does, doesn't, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what Saddam Hussein did. Is Saddam Hussein mobilized, mobilized 10,000 Iraqi military troops and sends them to their southern border, uh, all along the northern border of Kuwait? And then what happens is uh, George H.W. Bush's Secretary of Defense, who was, see, see how, see, the, see how they're all up on this? Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney is the Secretary of Defense under George H.W. Bush. So Dick Cheney contacts the, uh, after this has been delivered and they've mobilized their forces down there, Dick Cheney is the Secretary of Defense, contacts Prince Bandar who is the ambassador of the United States from Saudi Arabia, and asks him to come to the west wing of the, of the White House, and he brings him into a meeting where there's, uh, where there's uh, uh, at that time, Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, uh, his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, his attorney, David Addington, uh, Doug Fife, uh, Elliot Abrams, uh, and, uh, and uh, Scooter Libby are all in this meeting, Okay, and this is in July now of 1991. And he says, Prince Bandar, uh, I would like to inform you personally, face to face, that our United States intelligence community has come to find out that Saddam Hussein is mobilizing military forces on their southern border, their, the northern border of Kuwait, and they're preparing to invade and occupy Kuwait. Uh, and we have equally reliable intelligence that tells us that after, they've gone, after Saddam Hussein has gone in and occupied Kuwait, he's going to go into Saudi Arabia, and he's going to try to overthrow the House of Saud. Okay? Uh, and he says, by the way, let me show you, in order to show you that this is true, let me show you real-time NSA video from our satellites showing the 10,000 military troops assembled on the southern border of Iraq. And he shows them real-time footage from NSA satellites. Right? And so, so uh, Prince Bandar goes, oh my gosh, that, uh, that, that seems to be really credible, your assertions then. And so what, what Dick Cheney says to him, we would like to, if in fact uh, it's proven that he's getting ready to invade uh, Ku Kuwait and occupy Kuwait, we don't want you to wait until he's invaded and occupied Saudi Arabia, which, as it turns out, there was no evidence whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever to suggest he was going to do that. 
But he said that if, in fact, he, that, uh, he invades Kuwait and occupies them, then we would want you not to wait until he tries to invade Saudi Arabia. We'd like to have you invite us, that is me, Dick Cheney, to come over to China, or excuse me, come, come over to Saudi Arabia and meet with uh, King Faoud and Crown Prince Abdullah. Uh, and we would like to invoke the secret treaty, which none of you know anything about, and the fact is, even if you were at Harvard, uh, you know, in foreign policy, you wouldn't know anything about it. But the fact is, he said, we would like to invoke a secret treaty that was signed by Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger back in August of 1972, when they were on their way back from China in the SR-71 Blackbird, that, that big uh, stealth uh, vehicle, that they were on their way back from opening China, and they stopped in Saudi Arabia, uh, and Henry Kissinger and, uh, and, Dick and, uh, and Richard Nixon met personally with King Faisal, actually at that time King Faisal, met with King Faisal and, uh, and entered into an agreement that, the, uh, that Nixon and Kissinger would cause the, uh, the Western oil corporations, uh, the Seven Sisters, who had the exclusive 60-year lease agreement that had been signed at the end of World War I, to be able to have exclusive lease rights to all the oil in Saudi Arabia in exchange for a, like a 6% royalty being paid to the House of Saud, we would like to uh, renew, uh, we would like to have a, a new contract renewing that, that for an additional 60 years, and we will agree to allow you to raise the price of oil that you get from 42 cents on every gallon at the pump up to $1.42. You just have to agree that on that additional $1 a gallon at the pump of the price you're going to be getting now for your oil, that you need to use that $1, a portion of it, to buy military equipment exclusively, exclusively from United States military corporations, such as the AWACS uh, uh, airborne uh, uh, radar to the across-the-horizon radar to F-16s, etc., you need to purchase all of your military equipment from the United States uh, corporations. Secondly, you have to use another portion of that $1, uh, $1 a gallon at the pump that you're going to be getting. Uh, you need to use an additional portion of that to dredge out the harbors in your country to be able to take our American warships. And thirdly, you have to use the money to help build major military bases where we can fly in U.S. troops and land them in your country and establish a military presence in your country if either Russia or China make any type of a feint toward invading and occupying the Middle Eastern oil fields. Uh, and so the, that, that treaty got signed by King Faisal uh, back in August of 1972 with Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. And then they flew to Iran and got the same agreement from the, the, the Shah of Iran, uh, Pavlavi, signed the same agreement. And so what, what uh, Dick Cheney did now, flashing back up to 1991, that's like 20 years later, uh, when they're coming to the end of the Cold War, Dick Cheney tells, King, uh, tells Prince Bandar, uh, we would like to have a meeting to, if, if in fact it proves true that Saddam Hussein invades and occupies Kuwait, and is on the brink of going and invading uh, Saudi Arabia, we would like to have now King Faoud and Crown Prince Abdullah invite me to come over and we have a discussion about invoking the secret 1972 treaty, even though neither China nor Russia was uh, attempting to invade the oil fields, but Saddam Hussein is doing it. And so we'd like to have you call us in and we'll agree to drive Saddam Hussein back up into uh, Iraq. Uh, and so that's, that's what he asked him. And so Prince Bandar goes back to Saudi Arabia, and sure enough, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, uh, occupies Kuwait, and at which point uh, Dick Cheney flies over to, to Saudi Arabia and goes in and meets with King Faud and Crown Prince Abdullah, and he says, see, I told you so. 
There they are. They, they've done just what, he's done just what I told you he was going to do. Now we're telling you that we have equally reliable intelligence data suggesting that he's getting ready to invade Saudi Arabia and oust the House of Saud. So we'd like, to have, we'd like to invoke the secret 1972 treaty and have you invite us to come in, the United States, uh, and bring our warships into your harbors that have all been uh, dredged out now and, and fly our military troops into these bases that you've prepared for us. And uh, we will drive Saddam Hussein out of the country for you. Uh, so he, he puts that proposal to them. And uh, he's there at the, at the palace with them. And the chief of security for the House of Saud, Turkey bin Faisal, who is the son of former King Faisal, he was the chief of security for the House of Saud and for Saudi Arabia, comes in and sees Crown, Crown Prince Abdullah uh, and, and, uh, and King Faud. And he says, look, look, don't do this. Don't do this. If you invite the infidels to come into the Holy Land to drive Saddam Hussein out, they won't leave. They're going to try to occupy our oil fields. So don't do this. I have an alternative for you. Okay, just give me a chance to come in and meet with you tomorrow morning, like at 10 o'clock, and uh, I want to come in and have a meeting with you to propose an option. So he does that. The next morning he comes in and he brings in with him Khalil Mafus, who's the head of the Royal Saudi Family Bank, and he brings in with him uh, Mohammed Baroum, who is the heir to the wealthiest family in all of Saudi Arabia, who own the steel mills and all the concrete. This has basically been used to build the military fields. Okay? And they come in, the three of them come in and say, uh, Turkey bin Faisal says, look, uh, King Faud and Crown Prince Abdullah, don't do this. Uh, we've got an option, an alternative, and here it is. And they turn around, open the door, and in walks Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, who turns out to be the best boyhood friend of Turkey bin Faisal, since they were four years old together. And he comes in and he says, look, don't, don't invite the infidels to come in. They will never leave. I, I have 10,000 battle-hardened Mojahideen troops sitting up in the Khyber Pass right now. They just got through kicking the crap out of the, the Soviet Union for coming into Afghanistan. Okay, we've got all these troops prepared. We can drive them out. And uh, don't invite the infidels in because they won't leave. And so he then, they, he spends an hour and a half with big charts and everything showing how he'll go about this military campaign of driving Saddam Hussein out back into Iraq. So he then leaves and King, uh, King Faud and Crown Prince Abdullah are reflecting on the two offers. But it turns out that Dick Cheney was still there at the palace. And so what he does is finds out about this and he comes back and he says, I want to have a second meeting with King Faud and Crown Prince Abdullah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sweeten the, the offer. I'm going to offer to not only bring in our troops if you invite us in and protect you against Saddam Hussein coming in and invading Saudi Arabia and throwing the House of Saud out, but I will protect you and the Saudi family against your own people. They all hate you. You know that. I mean, they're all fundamentalist Islamicists. You guys have all these princes running around whoring all through Europe, you know, losing a million dollars at a time roll on a roll of a dice at Monte Carlo with all their Rolls Royces and Bentleys and all that stuff. They all hate you. You know, so what we'll do is if you invite us in, we'll protect you against your own people and these fundamentalist Islamicists. Okay? And then they agreed to do it. And they invited, they invited George H.W. Bush to come in. George H.W. Bush spent a couple weeks Bringing, organizing a thing they call the, the, uh, the Alliance of the, of the Willing, which I think include Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, Zambia, you know, a couple of these major military powers in the world, uh, to join with the United States, and they formed a, a, a major alliance to go in and invaded the Middle Eastern oil fields. And they occupied the Middle Eastern oil fields. They drove Saddam Hussein, all of whose troops turned around and ran hightailed away from them, and they slaughtered them as they were running away. Bombed them, strafed them, horrible videos of them just slaughtering uh, those troops as they're all trying to retreat and run back up into Iraq saying, wait a second, they told us that this was okay to do this, to go in, because all they were doing is going into Kuwait. Okay, and so the, they come in and they say, oh look, we're gonna drive Saddam Hussein back up into Iraq, but we're not gonna oust him from power. We're gonna leave him there, but we're gonna set up a no-fly zone. Uh, so that they can't, they can't put anything in the air, and it's going to take, oh, gee, 250,000 U.S. military personnel full-time on the ground 
in the Middle Eastern oil fields. And Osama bin Laden says, see, I told you so. That's exactly what I told you they were going to do. And he mounts jihad uh, against the U.S. military occupation of the oil fields. And they, they attack the embassies in, uh, in Africa. They, they uh, bomb the barracks in, uh, in Beirut. They attack the USS Coal in Yemen. And uh, the United States then gets all uppity uh, and says, oh, look, there's terrorism going on in the world. We have to have a massive military budget to fight off all these terrorists uh, because they're trying to throw us out of their own holy land. I mean, the audacity of these people. And they actually come up with the fact that, well, what they're really trying to do is get rid of our way of life. They can't stand our way of life. And so they're mounting this big, huge war against us. And what they want to do is establish a caliphate, you know, of, of having, uh, turning all of Europe and the world into a, a Shia, Shia religious fundamentalist group. Totally insane. I mean, as nuts as Donald Trump saying something like that. And so what, what they do is then, what happens is it turns out the Soviet Union does in fact dissolve uh, as they thought they were going to on, on December 31st of 1991 that, that uh, Gorbachev extracts an agreement from George H.W. Bush and from uh, James Baker III, his Secretary of State, that if Gorbachev agrees to release all of the, the republics from the USSR, that the United States will not ever try to recruit them into NATO. That will allow them to be neutral. They're all along the border, that, that western border of Russia. And so that they agreed to do that. H.W. Bush and, and, uh, and Baker agreed to do that. And so he signs the agreement. And the first Monday in January, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union on December 31st of 1991, that uh, the, the people in the Defense Department of the H.W. Bush administration under Dick Cheney convene again in the, white, in the, in the West Wing of the White House and uh, under Paul Wolfowitz and David Addington and Douglas Fife and Elliot Richardson and Scooter Libby and the other groups, they all, they gather and they draft up, here it comes, the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document which I want you all to be able to learn how to sing in your sleep. Because it turns out this document is extraordinarily important. Because what this is, is that the planning for the United States military at the end of the Cold War. And what they, de they develop this document, and they are advocating that rather than reduce the U.S. military budget here at the end of the Cold War, which we've been justifying on the grounds that the Soviet Union was going to be trying to invade the whole world and take it over, we, in fact, rather than reducing the U.S. military budget, we want to increase the military budget so that we can establish, and here's a phrase I want you to remember, full-spectrum dominance over the entire planet militarily, that we want to be able to vanquish any military power, either nation-state or uh, group actor, and we need to be able to vanquish any military force even inside their own national borders. And that that's what they advocate. They say, we are the sole remaining superpower in the world. We have a unique opportunity. There's a short window of opportunity here at the end of the Cold War for us to move into the power vacuum created by the withdrawal of the Soviet Union uh, from the Cold War, and we can establish full hegemony over the world, uh, and they prepare that document. They, they in fact, provide a, a copy of it to, the, to a select number of people in the Pentagon and a select number of members of the, of the uh, cabinet at that time, and, they, and someone leaks a copy of it to the Washington Post. And the Washington Post writes this attack on it, an editorial, saying, this is outrageous. This is, this is a return to the robber baron era. It's a return to the uh, age of American imperialism and gunboat diplomacy was the term they used. Uh, and it's, it's reprehensible. And the New York Times follows with an, a similar editorial on Sunday morning in the Sunday New York Times. And George Bush enters a public statement saying, look, I'm not acknowledging that any such document exists, but even if it does, uh, it's just a draft. And there, that we may be doing another draft, which he does do. 
he undertakes a second draft of the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance document in which he proposes the exact same thing except not to be done unilaterally solely on the part of the United States. It's to be done now in, uh, with a multilateral agreement on the part of the United States, Canada, Mexico, specifically saying not with the, not with the Mexican indigenous people, but with the PRI, which is the political party dominated by the Castilian Spanish, Caucasians, along with the UK, France, Spain, Italy, and the new reunited Germany, and with Russia. If Russia will agree to join now that they have spun off all of their ethnic provinces. That's what it says in the document. And the purpose of this new alliance will be to maintain our continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials needed by members of the new Northern Industrial Alliance. That's what you're looking at. What you're looking at is a policy that was formulated by George H.W. Bush and Dick Cheney uh, in his entire defense uh, department to try to establish full, full spectrum dominance over the planet, but not unilaterally as was advocated in draft one under Cheney, but expanded out by George Bush Sr. with Colin Powell and, and Theodore G. Shackley his director of covert operations, the ADDO, the Associate Deputy Director for Operations of the CIA, i.e. the head of covert operations worldwide, that they drafted up the second draft and expanded it out to a multilateral new Northern Industrial Alliance, which was intended to include Russia, now that they had spun off all of their ethnic provinces, i.e. non-Caucasian provinces. That's what you're looking at. That's what you're looking at here. And because, because uh, uh, Donald Trump is, as I said last Tuesday, because he's so simple-minded you know, and completely unsophisticated, he's a complete reductionist fool. And, and what he does is say, oh, wait a second, I get it, I get it. Let's get into Russia. Let's get Russia to join together in this. We'll be friends with Russia. I'll be friends with Putin. I'll be friends with Putin. And we'll end up having a deal where we'll bring in all the oil and will become major partners, as Bud McFarlane said in his article in the National Interest Magazine in June of 2016, within a month of the, the, the major policy speech delivered by Trump on April 27th of 2016, that Russia and the United States will become major partners in protecting and ensuring the security of our energy for Western civilization. And as I said, if you take China out of being the East and put them now in Western civilization, who's left? China. And you return to this right here. You return to the clash of civilizations, the remaking of world order by the president of the American Political Science Association, the head of foreign relations uh, policies at Harvard University, Samuel Huntington, that in fact we all have to gather our, and gird our loins to challenge and fight off the ascendancy to world power of China. And that's what's going on here. And so that the invasion and occupation of the Middle Eastern oil fields is part of a major plan to monopolize all of the oil uh, and natural gas on the planet as a source of energy. And they're having to build these pipelines to get the oil from up at 45 degrees north latitude all the way down into the warm water ports, and they've got to put them all the way down through North America, they've got to put them all the way down through Afghanistan uh, in the Middle East, down into the Sea of Arabia. And it is the indigenous people that are resisting them. The indigenous people in the tribes of the Middle East, uh, in the form of these fundamentalist, uh, jihadist uh, Islamicists, who are the, the fundamental tribal people there, and also the Lakota people and the other indigenous people in North America. Uh, they, they don't have major weapons. They don't have air forces. They don't have, you know, uh, nuclear weapons. They don't have any of that stuff. 
But what they have is they, as Jackson Brown says, you know, they pick up a rock or a stone, you know, and they fight them. And, you know, and they, they set bombs in the road, you know, for all their massive vehicles. It's like, and say, gee, we're being attacked by those people putting bombs in the road, blowing up our tanks rolling into their hometown. You know, I mean, what, I mean, what do you expect? This is outrageous, you know. Let's, let's go back and get more military people to go in and beat up on these people. You know, so, so that's, that's what's happening right now. And the, we, the, we're, we're going to be going into the details of these efforts on the part of the different indigenous grouping of people to resist the drilling, the mining, the building of these pipelines around the country so that we see that that is their point of vulnerability. There, there isn't going to do them any good to have all this oil up there in the frozen lands because they can't, they can't get it out of there. Uh, and that's what we're looking at. Okay, yes. so our main thesis is that um, we want to keep, in order for this to be worth their while, we have to maintain our dependency on oil. Yes. Right? So they need to um, not allow alternative energy sources to be part of the future. So well, if, if it, but one thing is important is that the, the petroleum is what fuels their fighter bombers, their, their, uh, their fighter jets, their tanks and vehicles, their, their ships, all of that, if they, if they can retain that resource and access to it, it's a military resource that they've got. They, they, could, they could allow for the development of some alternative energy to develop your electricity and stuff like that, but they want to continue burning this as a, as a war machine that they've got to, to maintain control over the world. So that what you'll see is like the Democratic Party, the new more moderate Democratic Party, can around the edges say, well, look, let's, have, let's, let's shift over to electrical power, you know, to generate your electricity at home, you know, the community choice energy companies and the stuff that we're all doing. But that's not going to stop us from burning all of this fossil fuel that we've got as a major military strategic uh, resource that we've got. The one thing I'm just wondering, if this is too much of an aside to do this to yeah. start it, but heard a story about when Tesla died, okay. they wanted to come and get his papers. They did come and his papers. And that they needed someone to understand what was in those papers, because it was scientific enough, but not yeah. just anybody in the FBI could interpret the papers. So who did they take the papers to? They took the papers to MIT to a professor there by the name of John G. Trump, and he was out to be Trump's uncle. And so I'm wondering if you know anything about that. I don't. But what, what, I, what I do know, however, is that the, the sale of the, the uh, Russian National Oil and Gas Company was scheduled to be signed on November 7th of 2016, the day before our election. And it would be given effect on December 10th. So that means that it, would be, it could be postponed if he didn't get elected. But if he got elected, then they would finalize it on December 10th. Uh, and with all the other indicia that we've got here that we listed out for you, there's strong circumstantial evidence that what it says in the, in the Steele dossier about uh, Carter Page having negotiated uh, with uh, Igor Sechin the CEO for uh, Rosneft, the National Oil Corporation, that that has the distinct possibility of being true uh, in explaining a whole lot of what's really going on. In, in closing, I'll point out that, that uh, contrary to what, uh, what Barr said about the Mueller report, which we know basically is without credibility and stuff, is that, that there is a, a line in even volume one, which has to do with the collusion and the conspiracy, is what, what, uh, what uh, Mueller actually said was that at, at the present time, I, I'm not in possession of adequate evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a specific agreement of any kind, any kind of a quid pro quo uh, here in anywhere. 
Uh, but there's, but some of this is because I've been blocked. People have been lying, uh, and I have assigned this further investigation to the FBI, who may develop information that may change my conclusion with regard to the existence of a c- criminal conspiracy for the Russian government and the Trump uh, campaign to collude uh, in, on behalf of Trump. And so that what I'm suggesting is, is that there's great value to be gained by directing attention to volume one, not giving up on this and retreating to volume two and saying nothing more than that there's obstruction. Because as a, as a, cr- a criminal trial lawyer who's got 50 years of experience here, I'm telling you, you try to charge someone with obstructing justice and there's no crime at the base of it that they could be obstructing, uh, you've got a long haul here, you know, to, to convict anybody of that. And so that, that, that argument has to be overcome. You need to look at the evidence of collusion, what the reason for the collusion would be, the mechanics of the collusion, and if, in fact, it's true what is said in the Steele dossier in that one line that Carter Page negotiated this deal with Igor Sechin, the CEO of Rosneft, to sell a 19.5% interest in the Russian oil corporation uh, or company to Trump and his associates in exchange for them coming in and lifting, lifting the uh, restrictions against the, the, uh, the export of Russian oil. If, if that can be established, if the FBI is genuinely going to look into that, that uh, this could change the entire picture of the, of the impeachment because it would show that he's engaged in self-dealing as a personal business deal with Putin because that, the, the oil, the 87 billion barrels of oil and the 30% of all the natural gas under the Arctic shelf is projected to be worth 10 trillion dollars and so a 20 percent interest in that is enough to motivate trump to do anything that he needs to do to lift those restrictions against them and he thinks he can rationalize it and say wait a second this is the same thing that george hw bush was trying to do he was trying to agree to establish this alliance and bring russia into it so that we could monopolize the oil and so he sees it in the back of his mind as a perfectly legitimate Republican Party strategy. Uh, so, so this is, this is uh, what we're going to be uh, looking at in the course is the potential efficacy of the indigenous people to, to stop the, uh, the mining of, the, uh, of the, these fields, the drilling of the oil uh, in their territories, the movie, and especially the moving of these pipelines down through their indigenous territory and see what type of alliance can be established on the part of the Caucasian people who the Republican Party and Trump and everybody assumes are going to be on their side. And, so, and that's the problem because it turns out some significant portion of them are, you know, for racial reasons and for economic reasons. Uh, and so that we have to try to, as, as a, an alliance between your generation and my generation, we have to try to figure out what possible kind of alliance can be established to protect your generation from an absolutely horrific future that you've got to look at with potential 250-foot sea rises and 160-degree mean global temperature during your lifetimes. Okay? So in case you want to come to the next class, it's on the Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, at uh, 3.15. Uh, kids, I'll, I'll do your papers uh, over the weekend. I'll have, them, I'll have them back to you on Tuesday. That means our time is up. Okay? Thank you.